when you come across a situation where a friend is in pain or suffering, mental distress, and you can help the friend. You can help that person overcome the pain, get over the distress. It gives rise to a very good feeling in the heart. The problem is there are other times when we're with other people and they're in pain and we can't reach them. This is especially true around issues of birth, illness, and death. Sometimes you have a newborn child and the child is crying and crying and crying. No matter what you do, the child won't stop. It seems hard to believe that there can be so much pain and anguish in such a little tiny body. But there it is. And you can't reach the child. When someone is very ill and demented, you can't reach that person sometimes. They're suffering their own private pains, and especially at death. There comes a point where even before the actual moment of death, you realize that person is beyond you and you can't reach in and help, no matter how much you might want to. That's when you realize how much pain is a very private matter, how much anguish and suffering are a private matter. And we like to think that we can help one another through this, but there's a lot that each person has to do for him or herself. The Buddha talks about the pain of aging, illness, and death in his first sermon, which we chanted just now. And he says, we don't suffer for lack of help from other people. It's because of our own lack of skill inside. Our knowledge isn't skillful. Our desires are not skillful. And this is something that only we can take care of ourselves. Because you can't teach someone else to be skillful. You can teach them how they might try to train themselves to be skillful, but you can't just take your skill and put it in somebody else's head, you know, somebody else's hands. They have to learn how to observe from within. What kind of thinking is skillful? What kind of acting? What kind of speaking is skillful? What kind is not? And if they find themselves engaged in unskillful habits, they've got to learn how to overcome those habits and to make them more skillful. We can't do this for each other. It's a private matter, an individual matter. So this is why the Buddha taught the way he did. He had developed the skill, and he was going to explain to other people how they could develop the skill as well. He acted as an example. He showed the way, but that was as far as he could go. From that point on, it was up to each individual person to develop the skill on their own. Someone once asked the Buddha why it was that when some people followed his teachings, they got the results, began to awaken. Other people followed his teachings and didn't get those results. Was there something wrong with his teaching? And the Buddha said, well, have you ever given directions to someone on how to follow the road from Rajgir to Nalanda? And the guy said, yeah. And did everybody get there? Well, some people didn't follow my instructions, the man said. They went astray. And so was it your fault that they went astray? He said, no, I gave, them, I gave the same instructions to everybody. And the Buddha said it was the same in his case. He gave the instructions. Some people followed them, some people didn't. But it was beyond his power to force people to follow his instructions. So he keeps throwing it back at us. It's up to us to deal with our own lack of skill, to figure out 
where our thoughts are unskillful, where our attitudes are unskillful, where the way we look at things is unskillful, and then make a change. He wants us to make ourselves skillful. He wants us to make ourselves strong. You notice the most common image that you see in front of every Buddhist meditation hall. It's a Buddha image. It's the Buddha sitting there meditating. He's not nailed to a cross. He doesn't offer himself as food. Basically, he tells us, this is how you learn how to feed yourselves, so that you eventually reach the point where you don't need to feed anymore. You develop internal strengths, conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, discernment. These are qualities we all have to some extent, but we've got to learn how to strengthen them. And they, in turn, make the mind stronger. So our food here is not bread and wine. Our food is concentration. The Buddha compared concentration to different types of, types of food. The first jhana, he said, is like grass and water. Then you work up through the other jhanas. You get rice and you get beans. And finally you get honey, ghee, sugar. This is our food on the path. And it's something we have to learn how to fix within ourselves. We have to become our own cooks. The ingredients are all here. It's simply a matter of putting them together and learning how to nourish yourself with them. So instead of offering us an unending source of food from outside, he's teaching us how to feed from within. And that ultimately strengthen the mind to the point where it doesn't need to feed anymore. And when you're in that position, you're not the only one who benefits. The people around you benefit as well. If you have to feed off of their good moods, they've got to provide you with good, good moods. I once remember hearing it, one Dharma teacher say that he didn't want to live in a world where there was no suffering because he wouldn't be able to exercise his compassion without thinking what a selfish attitude that is. You want the gratification that comes from exercising your compassion, so you need other people who are suffering. Ideally, what you want is a world where nobody's suffering. And the only way you can do that is to teach everybody how to f fix their own food, learn to be more skillful inside. And some people will want to do that, and some people won't. But you don't grasp onto them, saying, please stay here and suffer so I can feel good about being compassionate. Or be, please be here for me when I need you. And the Buddha's final nirvana it was an act of kindness. He showed us that the best thing a person can do is to find true happiness inside and then get out of the food chain. That's the example he left for us, so that your pursuit of true happiness, he says, is not something to be ashamed of. It's not a lowly pursuit or a childish pursuit. It's something noble, because this pursuit of true happiness is not a grasping kind of happiness or a grasping kind of pursuit. It involves developing qualities of wisdom, purity, compassion. The wisdom to realize that you're going to have to depend on yourself for your happiness, and that the happiness that's worth working toward is a long-term happiness, not a short-term one. From that grows compassion, the realization that other people want happiness too. And if your happiness depends on their suffering, they're not going to let your happiness be long-term. They're going to try to cut it short. So if you want long-term happiness, you can't harm other people. And then purity comes from actually looking at your actions, your thoughts, your words, and your deeds, to see where they cause harm, either for yourself or for others. 
and then you learn how to avoid that harm. So the pursuit of happiness, if you can conduct it in the right way, leads to noble qualities in the mind. And that way you become a refuge. You join the noble sangha, and you actually become a refuge to other people in the sense that you become an example to them as well. So that they can learn how to strengthen themselves and learn how to feed themselves. This is how the Dharma is passed on. So even though our pursuit may be for something very private and very individual, the way we pursue this happiness, this skill that enables us not to suffer even through illness, not to suffer even through death, we take care of that part of ourselves that no one else can reach. Because if we don't take care of this, where are we going to be? We'll be thrashing around, placing burdens on other people leaving them miserable because they see ultimately that they can't help our suffering either, deep down inside. But if you learn how to take care of that part inside you, you've taken care of your responsibility. And then whatever, whatever other gifts you have for other people, they're offered freely. They're not offered in exchange for, you take care of me and I'll take care of you. They say, here, look, take this. I don't need it anymore. That's a very different kind of relationship. It doesn't come with a quid, quo, <clears throat> quid pro quo of, okay, I'll be nice to you and you'll be nice to me. It's simply, here, take. But the Buddha doesn't say, this is my body offered to you. He says, look, this is how you can learn how to feed yourself from within, how you can learn how to grow strong. So ultimately, you don't need to feed anymore. That's probably the greatest gift there is. <clears throat>